Hi everyone, Phil Morera here, litigation lawyer with the law firm Val Legal. We're here again answering questions that we are commonly asked about car accidents and insurance issues relating to injuries resulting from car accidents. Knowing the answers to these questions can be helpful for you, not only in optimizing your treatment and, and medical recovery going forward, but they can also help in making sure any claims that you bring forward as a result of the car accident go forward as smoothly as possible. For more information, feel free to visit our website at valentlegal.ca or you can follow us on Instagram. Okay, so let's answer some more car accident and insurance related questions. The first question today is what should I do if I was involved in a hit and run accident? So any car accident, of course, can be confusing. You'll have lots of questions. Many people don't know what to do after a car accident. And in a hit and run accident, those questions are a little bit more pressing and can be even more confusing than a normal car accident. If you are involved in a hit and run accident, the steps that you should take following are kind of the same as if it were an ordinary non hit and run car accident. Check yourself for injuries. You'll want to make sure that it's safe to exit the vehicle, gather in any information if need be. But in a hit and run accident, often there will be not much information to gather because theoretically the at fault driver is no longer at the scene. So after a hit and run accident, what you'll want to do first and foremost is notify the police. The police should attend the scene. You'll explain to them everything that you observed happened. You'll explain everything to the best of your ability as to what, if anything, you observed about the other vehicle. The police will then render a police report and that is kept in a central location, whether it's at the municipal police department or with the RCMP. What you should also do is contact your own insurance company and notify them of the collision and any information that you're able to provide them, not only about your own situation, including your injuries, your property damage, but anything that you might know about the other vehicle. It's important to have all of that information relayed to your insurance company as well as the police in the event that you want to bring a claim forward for your injuries. And if you were to do so in relation to a hit and run accident, you would typically do so under what's called Section D of your own insurance policy policy, which allows you to bring a claim against the at-fault driver through your own insurance company as you don't specifically know who, if anyone, the other driver is insured with. The next question is what are weekly indemnity benefits? So weekly indemnity benefits are otherwise known as wage loss benefits that are available under section B of your own insurance policy, which are otherwise known as no fault accident benefits. So section B of your insurance policy is the section of the policy that deals with your treatment requirements following a car accident. And it also provides supplemental wage loss benefits. And those are weekly indemnity benefits. Provided that you're involved in a car accident, you are injured and you're forced to take time off work as a result of your injuries, if you meet a certain number of criteria under the policy of insurance, you would be entitled to weekly indemnity benefits, which provide for $250 a week in wage loss benefits or 80% of your ordinary salary, whichever is less. So to access uh, weekly indemnity benefits, typically you'll need to demonstrate that you are off work from seven of the first 30 days following an accident, that you were put off work by a medical doctor, and that you were employed for six of the 12 months directly before the car accident. The next question is, can insurance companies use social media to deny my claim? The short answer is maybe. Insurance companies will often look to social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, to really see what a claimant is up to. We all know that these social media accounts provide only snapshots of someone's life. They don't really tell the full story in terms of what someone is doing 24 hours a day. But insurance companies will often try to pull material from social media accounts to try to manipulate a claim and, and make it seem like a person is either not injured or not as injured as they are claiming to be. It's the first place insurance companies will often look to see who a claimant is, what they're up to, what their ordinary day-to-day -day life looks like. And again, they can try to manipulate this to their advantage to try to either deny a claim altogether or to limit the compensation you might be entitled to resulting from your injuries. Of course, people are free to live their lives as they ordinarily would after sustaining injuries in a car accident. But just know that there is a caution that applies that insurance companies will often try to pull material from social media accounts and try to use it to their own advantage and to the claimant's disadvantage. The next question is what compensation am I entitled to after a car accident? So there's a number of different categories of damages and damages is just a fancy legal word for money that people are entitled to if they've suffered injuries in a car accident. The first and foremost is what's called pain and suffering, which is your loss of amenities of life, your hobbies, your leisure activities, the fun that you have, the joy that you get out of certain activities. Can you canoe to the extent that you used to? Can you go biking? Can you go jogging? Can you exercise and go to the gym? 
time are your abilities to parent compromised by your injuries, so on and so forth. The next would be loss of income, which is any wages or other benefits that you may be losing by being unable to work as a result of your injuries following a car accident. And there's another income related category of compensation called loss of earning capacity. And that asks the question, are you now in a position to not earn as much as you would have ordinarily earned if the injuries hadn't happened? There's another category of damages called loss of valuable services, which thinks about your ability to do housework. Can you shovel? Can you mow the lawn? Can you do the dishes? Can you carry the laundry up the stairs the way that you used to before your injuries? Those types of things. The next would be cost of care, both care that has happened in the past, in the present, or into the future. Will you need physiotherapy going forward? Will you need osteopathy? Will you need massage therapy? Do you need to see a psychological counselor? These are all the sorts of things that go into that category of damages. The next question is what is section B? So under every insurance policy in Nova Scotia, there are four sections to every insurance policy, sections A, B, C, and D. Section B is the section of everyone's insurance policy that deals with what are called no-fault benefits. And what that means is irrespective of whoever's at fault for the accident, you are entitled to receive benefits from your own insurance company for your immediate treatment needs if you are injured after an accident. Section B also provides for what are called weekly indemnity benefits or wage loss benefits that help supplement your income in the event that you're not able to work as a result of your injuries following a car accident. Again, these are no-fault benefits. You're entitled to them regardless of whether you or someone else was at fault for the accident. The next question today is what do I do if my child was involved in a car accident? Now car accidents can be scary enough on their own when we're speaking about adults who sustain injuries in an accident, but it's that much scarier when we're dealing with, with a child, of course. The same principles all apply as to what to do after a car accident. Make sure the child is checked for injuries. If there are any discernible injuries, contact emergency personnel as soon as possible. Make sure the child is in for the appropriate assessment and therapy if need be. A child in Nova Scotia at law really means anyone who's under the age of 19 for, for legal purposes. So they would have all the same rights and obligations as someone who's over the age of 19 when it comes to an injury claim. They'd be entitled to the same benefits under Section B of an insurance policy. Typically in Nova Scotia, anyone under the age of majority would require what's called a litigation guardian to bring their claim forward. And that's someone who stands in place of the child who is over the age of majority to make legal decisions on their behalf. The next question is, will my personal injury claim go to court? It's often not quite as simple as yes or no. Most injury claims in Nova Scotia do not go all the way to a trial. Typically what happens first is if and when someone does suffer injuries in a car accident, it's always in their best interest to approach a personal injury lawyer to discuss their rights and obligations. What would happen generally first is a, a claim would be opened and brought forward against the at-fault driver's insurance company. The insurance company would then assign an insurance adjuster to administer the claim and your lawyer, your personal injury lawyer, would process the claim as between them and, and the insurance adjuster. Typically, what would happen when the insurance adjuster is assigned, and what would then usually happen is there would be ne settlement negotiations between your personal injury lawyer and the insurance adjuster. In the event that those negotiations fail and they, they don't result in a negotiated settlement, what can then happen is a lawsuit will be necessary. Your personal injury lawyer will prepare and file that lawsuit. The insurance adjuster will then assign their own lawyer to administer the claim and from there the parties exchange all documents with one another and proceed to what are called discovery examinations. That process is known as litigation. Theoretically, most people would know that as court. But long story short, just to bring an injury claim forward does not mean you're going to be standing in front of a judge at a trial in relation to your injury claim. Very few of these cases in Nova Scotia, in fact, go all the way to a trial. The next question is what is the minor injury cap? So the minor injury cap, otherwise known as the cap, is a rule that's set up under Nova Scotia law that says anyone who suffers a minor injury in a car accident, the most amount that they can recover for what are called pain and suffering damages is about $8,900 in 2020 figures. A minor injury, as it's described in the appropriate regulations, is a sprain, strain, or certain whiplash-related injuries that don't result in a serious impairment. This is a bit complicated because 
insurance companies will often try to say that an injury claim is subject to the minor injury cap when in fact it might not be. There are a lot of legal nuances that go into that argument as to whether a claim is or is not subject to the minor injury cap. And if you have a claim and you're in discussions with the at-fault driver's insurance company and they raise this issue, it's most definitely in your best interest to consult with an experienced personal injury lawyer just to make sure that you understand everything that goes into that argument and to have a discussion on whether or not the claim is or is likely not subject to the minor injury cap. So those are answers to some more frequently asked questions that we receive about car accident and insurance issues. If you found these answers helpful, put your comments in the comments section below. And otherwise, if you'd like more information, feel free to visit our website at valentlegal.ca or you can follow us on Instagram.